Northern Ireland has many problems and they impinge on British politics. The Northern Ireland Protocol is particular symptom of the ill health of British politics. All healthy democracies have both law and politics. In that sense, the EU is a healthy democracy. The British system is an unhealthy system on the Northern Ireland Protocol because it has lawless politics. The Northern Ireland Protocol is an agreement in which, uh, under international law, the UK withdraws from the con European Union. From the EU's point of view, it sets the laws, the rules for post-withdrawal politics. From the British point of view, it just starts a new political negotiation and the previous things don't matter. It makes explicit references to a customs border with the Republic. However, it does so at the price of establishing a border within the United Kingdom, which is a unitary state. Even in a federal state like the United States, it was made illegal 200 years ago to have a trade border with the, within the United States. But Boris Johnson just did this because his object was to get Brexit done by a deadline and to have the cheering bury the detail. There was another way to do it, which Theresa May negotiated, which was to accept governance of trade with Northern Ireland and the Republic by um, EU standards. Be that as it may, that was rejected by Downing Street and the protocol is now in international law. Now, the interesting thing is that the basic principle is an old Latin principle, pacta sunt servanda. The normal Latin scholar, classic scholar, would translate this as contracts should be observed. However, Boris Johnson, in spite of all of his classical training, is Boris Johnson, and he translates it as Parliament is sovereign. And in fact, uh, as I've shown in many books, this means the party with a majority is sovereign and the leader of that party as prime minister can do what he likes as long as the House of Commons endorses him. I make this quite clear in my book, How Sick is British Democracy in Clinical Analysis. Now, Boris Johnson isn't the only prime minister who disregards international laws or treats them cavalierly. After all, Tony Blair twisted his own uh, legal advisors to say that the, it was legal to go to war in Iraq. And if he didn't believe Tony Blair, he should ask Washington to take legal guidance where they justified going to war on grounds that turned out to be specious. <clears throat> the EU is a normal country in that sense. It wants the laws observed. Margaret Thatcher understood that, and that's why she argued for the EU repealing laws and using its treaty powers in order to create the single Europe market, which made free trade Thatcher's vision of a single market across Europe for British goods and services a reality. What she didn't realize was that other people could use EU laws to regulate conditions of work in the United Kingdom and to regulate the production of goods and services. And the French socialist Jacques Delors and others promoted the EU doing that. In other words, 
the basic principle of the rule of law is you obey them whether you like them or not. And if you don't want to obey them, you must live in a country like North Korea, which is closed, where you don't have to deal with foreigners. However, this contradicts the vision of Britain since the Free Trade Act of the 1840s, and more recently, from Winston Churchill to Tony Blair, there was a vision of Britain being at the center of three circles, the Commonwealth, a special relationship, and Europe. Now, the interesting thing is that it's only the relationship with Europe that is governed by law as well as politics. The relationship with countries from Australia to Zimbabwe is, in the Commonwealth is pure politics. And equally with Washington, it's personal relationships with the White House and hope that the White House politics with its own US Congress is agreeable to what Britain wants. <clears throat> However, there's something to be said for politics. In other words, Churchill made the point that jaw jaw is better than war war. And if you don't have courts, you can talk about things. And a lot of foreign policy where you can't do anything and it's lawless strife in, Af in an African state uh, is settled by issuing pronouncements. I suspect that the climate change in Glasgow on settling the world's climate policies will produce good intentions, but it won't produce a binding agreement like the Northern Ireland Protocol, which the signers are supposed to live up to and which can be enforced. Now, the optimist says that the failure to see that this is a symptom uh, of problem, says that the British politicians have a cognitive disability. That is, they can't see what's looking in front of them, which is their own signature to the withdrawal agreement and their approval of the Northern Ireland Protocol, that they must just accept what's there. Well, now, I think this is overly optimistic. Because after all, Lord Frost has been spending hours and days and weeks and months sitting opposite Barnier and the EU Commission negotiating team. And he realized he wasn't just talking to himself, but he was talking with the EU representative who wanted something in exchange. And that was an agreement that would respect the EU laws on trade. And if Johnson wanted something, which was a withdrawal agreement by the 31st of December, then Johnson had to give something. It was a trade. After all, if you were buying a horse, you'd exchange money for a horse. If you wanted to get Brexit done, having won an election, you would have to exchange something that Brussels wanted because they weren't in business just to deliver a speech for Boris Johnson or any prime minister. As I show in my book, there's really an underlying symptom of ill health, mental ill health, and it almost needs the treatment of a community psychiatrist based in Southwest Wall possibly in the cabinet office, but with a connecting door into number 10 and 11. Because um, the British prime minister, once in office, sees himself at the center of these three worlds. And this gives him a you or her a unique status within Britain. But it doesn't get rid of the fact that once you deal with foreigners, they expect you to keep your word if you sign a written agreement. 
and the Northern Ireland Protocol in such an agreement. David Cameron made this mistake because when the Brexiters in his own party started hounding him to call a referendum, he said, we don't need to leave the European Union. I will negotiate new conditions which will get rid of the problems that are bothering us. So first he took his children to see the German Chancellor for a weekend and thought charm would be enough with an East German physicist with a PhD. Hmm. Well, that shows some sort of mental belief that heat and charm will get you anywhere. It didn't work. Then he went and negotiated four conditions which consisted of promises to look at this and look at that. And the Brexiters actually didn't have this mental ill health problem of not being able to read what was on paper. And what they saw was piffle, to use a good English expression. It really wasn't worth much. And so they campaigned for a referendum and for a withdrawal. However, what all the British parties have learned is that you can take back control and set up an autarky where you grow your own food and you only make, the city of London only makes money by dealing with other people in England, but you can't really have a global Britain. And what Boris Johnson proposes is a global Britain with all sorts of trade agreements. Now, when you make a trade agreement, you expect, for example, the United States to take Scotch whiskey or whatever it is, or China from wedge, uh, the potteries and from products from red wall seats. And you accept, uh, Britain accepts what they have. And you don't back out on that because if you back out on a trade agreement with a foreign country, they will impose sanctions too, as the United States has done when there were certain problems coming up already. So if you want to um, have a foreign policy, you have to deal with foreigners. And if you reach an agreement that's supposed to be effective, rather than just a mere form of words, a symbol that pastes over a civil war on another continent. You've really got to have something firm. You've got to um, live, have your word taken seriously. And people do take Boris Johnson seriously. They believe he won't stick to anything he agrees. So the problem as I see it, which the Northern Ireland Protocol illustrates, is that Britain is trying to punch above its weight. It's trying to enforce the sovereignty of parliament on other countries that have their own sovereignty and their own constitution and their own courts, which they're accustomed to obey. And of course, if you try and punch above your weight, the simple thing is you get knocked flat. Now the medium term solution is not that Britain goes around making treaties, uh, twisting out of them, getting knocked flat by enforcement on other countries and having to come back sniveling and groveling, admitting, okay, we'll live up to our word because you'll punish it if we don't. The real problem is I see it, that if you have this mental ill health, you ignore foreigners, that they ignore you, that when the EU makes its policy to 27 countries, it's what uh, Berlin says to Paris, that if London rings, Downing Street rings, they'll put them on hold and you can be on hold for a long, long time. More explicitly, what the Northern Ireland problem 
represents, which is particularly important to Downing Street, is the reaction in Washington. Because uh, not only is Congress full of Irish Americans, but President Biden has family connections with Ireland, and the bit happens to be in Northern Ireland. So he really has a stake. And there you don't have to be ignored. The alternative, if you don't believe in keeping your word, is that you can be blackballed by the White House.